Good evening, everyone. I'd like to start out tonight uh, talk about Obama a little bit, about how he said he'd bring change. And we all heard about his energy back when he campaigned, what his plan would be to necessarily skyrocket rocket our energy prices. This little article here about how he's still trying to reshape. Even though we flat out know that he dished out our money to bankrupt companies and played the buddy system. Somebody got rich off the deal, off our money. And that's the way it was concocted to begin with. So the gist of this article, <clears throat> it, it starts off talking about Solyndra and the speech that he made and the money that they were given and what has actually happened where it's shut down, jobs lost, but they still got the money. So it apparently the, the ripoff will continue and you are you have a left wing group called Beyond Coal and they are they are uh, into the sh liking the shutting down of coal plants to for a changeover into a green system and this is the article about the green system that he gave money to that went down the crapper and it sounds like uh, he wants to give some more money to the companies that's already down the crapper so when you look into what has he done to coal so far well he shut down 110 out of 522 plants, 13 percent of all the coal-based electrical capacity in our country. And they're going to have a bunch of new taxes to pay because there's two rules, the utility MACT rule and a rule on coal ash that's going to put 31 billion more of a burden on them. Now that's according to his in his pocket EPA estimates their selves. So that would be coming estimated from the EPA himself. Now he's assaulting all the cheap stuff. I mean oil companies aren't great and everything, but they don't make as much as per the gallon as what you think. I mean, like I've said before, whatever it's trading for, divide 55 into it. That's how many gallons are in a barrel, right? So they're buying it in a barrel before they bring it back and transport it at a cost to them. And then they have to refine it. Get it refined and made into gas and truck it back out to the fueling stations, right? They're not the greatest things in the world, but we got to have gas, don't we? And we'd like it to be reasonable. So an assault on the cheap stuff for reasonable prices is not logical. He always says we need an all-of-the-above approach, but yet whenever you look into his all-of-the-above approach, you see he's shutting down coal, he's placing new regulations and taxes upon the, the coal industry and he's wanting to tax the big oil companies out to yin yang and then uh, offshore drilling permits I believe they're down uh, he's messing around with the pipeline that they want to lay and and nobody's getting that okay so where is the all of the above approach why would you loan money out to another country so they can use it in their oil industry to get the oil out of the ground from offshore like you won't let us do here to the extent that they would like to if they can do it safely and then the, the oil they would take from their own country's seafloor they would put back onto the international market and then the United States would buy that oil 
we would that's what he's done he's actually paid I think it was Brazil he's actually loaned money paid our money to another country so they can drill for their oil offshore put it on the world market of which we'll end up purchasing it well those are things you need to think about what this man is doing it's not a heck of a choice when you have to choose between him and Romney uh, I know that but it's all set the game is already placed so it's not going to get much better under Romney even under a if we, you know, Obama is not placed back in, which I think he will by hook or crook. You know, we've already seen with Bush that something real, real close comes down to the Supreme Court. Bush was never elected. Bush was selected. Okay. Then we come into this little deal here, and you hear a lot of things. You hear that the the U.S. says that they would would attack. As you see, you have plans in place to attack if Iran, you know, tries to keep developing nuclear weapons. But then. You hear they don't want to, but they have a plan. And then you hear Israel. Well, you know, they have to watch what's going on. They're surrounded. So, like I said before, they're doing the virus things, trying to mess up the computer systems and developmental systems, processing units, so that they can't proceed. Well, that is a war, but it's not a war with bombs. Israel is already in that type of a war right now. So if everybody that thinks that they're just picking on Iran, if Iran wasn't doing anything wrong, it would be consequentially terrible for the rest of the world in the long run when you can look out of the box. If they weren't, then there would be no need for virusizing their computer systems and stuff to try and prevent it. If it was truly for peaceful purposes and power, well, I'm sure that the world would give them the go-ahead. But when you make boastful statements that you want to wipe an entire nation and all their people off the map so that they don't even exist upon our world, you cannot be trusted. So nobody's picking on Iran. Iran will go against Israel. They will also somehow get what they want if they don't already have it. <clears throat> but Obama has assured Israel that the U.S. is prepared to take action if it's necessary. And the five members of the Security Council in Germany have already met on the 23rd in Baghdad as we know. And the, the Israelis have said a nuclear weapon in the hands of Iran would threaten their survival and it, it, it would. Ahmadinejad has already said what he did. Even he takes orders from his higher-ups, the supreme leaders and whatnot, the religious uh, councils and he will do what they tell him to do. If they order to strike, it would be right up his alley. He would love it, because that's what he wants to do anyway. You know what I'm saying? If Ahmadinejad did not want to strike and was ordered to do it, he'd carry it out like a good little soldier. So they will eventually get what they want. So we are urging Israel to refrain, supposedly. At least to this point we are. Economic sanctions are 
or doing whatever they are. But as we've discussed before, if there is a strike, the strike itself is not so much what the Israelis are worried about. It's the aftermath of the strike with the response by all the other Arabs and all the other Arab countries and cities and everything. That's what they uh, would worry about the most. You know, we've just entered into June and we'll see if we can make it another month. Now let's take a look here in our uh, earthquake situation whenever we bring it up here. And we've had some action down in Panama. You can see there's a 6.4 and a 6.2 those are the hot spots right here 6.4 and 6.2 along our coastline up here and throughout Alaska the magnitudes are pretty low as are out to our east southeast if we spin it around and we look all over the globe we're not going to find that many uh, well, we won't find any more sixes. This is the only region right now at, at this time that's popping with anything of that magnitude. But you'll see, as usual, four, four and a half, five, you know, in there, mainly. With your threes, your smaller magnitudes. And it has calmed down for the moment now along the seam. And that's, that is a remarkably great, great thing. Argentina, uh, it's been a while since the uh, 6.7, I believe it was. What was that, like the 28th? Uh, I believe they did have a, a flat out 6.0. Then we'll go ahead and look back. And we'll take a look at our chart. And you can read off on the chart, 6.4 and 6.2 right here. And you see the magnitudes are fairly, they're reasonable. We'll call it that. Reasonable. If you could be reasonable with an earthquake. And then you see uh, some lesser ones south of Panama. There's Chile, 4.5. Here's Italy again. And uh, they need some, some prayers really bad right now. They're not used to the situation here. You know, there's areas where they're used to feeling stuff like Japan and off, you know, lower magnitudes in California and stuff, but Italy's kind of a rare thing to me as far as being buildings knocked down and everything and people dying. You, know, you see China Four and a half, Bolivia, Panama again. Saratonga is not too bad. And yeah, you did get your on the second. In Argentina, six flat, six point oh. So other than that, we seem to be doing reason reasonable with our locations and our earthquakes. So, we've got ourselves a new movie that came out, <clears throat> and it takes the name from the Greek god. Oh, who is Prometheus? And if I have the story right, Prometheus is a prequel to the original Alien uh, series of movies with Sigourney Weaver. Now, this would be all stuff that happened before she and her crew got involved with the aliens. Well, this is a short take on him. He was a titan god. 
a forethought crafty council who was entrusted with the task of molding mankind out of clay. He was, according to, to their lore, belief, writing, whatever, you, know, you, you can read right over some things, but you need to stop and think what, is, what exactly does their lore say. And so he was entrusted with the task of molding mankind out of clay. So it's, he was entrusted with the task of more or less creating mankind. His attempts to better the lives of his creation brought him into conflict with his daddy, Zeus. Well, maybe he had more than one daddy, we don't know. Truly about these gods is we know what we think we know but Zeus is the big man firstly he tricked him tricked the gods out of the best portion of the sacrificial feast acquiring the meat for the feasting of man who he created and then when Zeus withheld fire said no they can't have it or something to that nature. He stole it from where? Heaven. And delivered it to mortal kind hidden inside a fennel stalk. And as punishment for these rebellious acts of doing exactly what he was not supposed to do, Zeus ordered the creation of Pandora. Pandora. Zeus ordered the creation of Pandora, and this is the first woman, as a means to deliver misfortune into the house of man, or as a way to cheat mankind of the company of the good spirits. Pr Prometheus, you know, meanwhile got arrested and bound to a stake on Mount Caucasus, where an eagle was set to feed upon his ever regenerating liver. Some think heart. And generations later, the great hero Heracles, or as we know him, Hercules, came along and released the old titan from his torture. He was identified in cult myth with the fire god Hephaestus and the giant Titus. So this is just one writing. You can go into archaeological writings or mythological writings elsewhere but you get the same basic idea of whom Prometheus was a supposed creator of man a supposed helper that gave man the good meat and the light the firelight the heat from the fire and was punished and he would have been bound to that mountain forever apparently or until Mr. Zeus was oh, in a mood to let him go decided he'd, he'd been pecked on enough and eaten on enough and then you have the great hero Heracles who was he? well he was one of them he was not all human he had half God, half human in him. So he was like helping family. He came to the aid of a, oh, I don't know, you could call him a distant cousin or whatever you want to call him in relation to each other. But he had his blood, non-human blood in him, just like the Titan God did non-human blood so family helped family he released him and there goes your uh, your lore know the movie not to give anything away has a little bit to do with something it looks like about uh, humans and maybe transhumanism transforming something making something for those that are gonna go and watch it. It's just hope that you haven't seen all the good parts on the previews already. That's the way they're 
movies seem to be these days. Everything you've already seen on the preview turns out to be the best part of it once you get inside. Not all of them, but some of them. So those are just a few things that I wanted to discuss. Here's your power situation, what he's doing to it. It's amazing, and that just tells you that uh, they can jack your prices up anytime they want. Because the price of gas has came down. And the analysts were expecting well over four. And there's supposed to be a glutton of it right now, a backlog where there's a real supply. So usually when that happens and OPEC says there's too much supply out there, we're going to cut back on production. So it's a yo-yo situation, and that's that's all they do. You know, and then you mix in uh, some high-paid speculators that put some trash out there that make the markets jittery. Things are are rigged everywhere. It's it's hard to believe, and you can think of, even think about Facebook. Whenever they went public, what what did they do? The stock price was being the share price was being set before the the, the stock ever went public to be bought by the public. You know there was a group of high pay, paid rich guys, or excuse me, I didn't mean high paid, but a group of rich guys, along with the Facebook, and they were all deciding what what is this stuff going to be off, offered as. And, and from what I understand, they were allowed opportunity to purchase before the public. So they purchased at a lower price. It got offered to the public. The price went up. And it looks like they sold. I haven't found anything that says they haven't. But I have found some things that said they had. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So you need to tell me if you if you've seen something to the contrary on anything like that. But it looks like they dumped and they took their profit. And then the when they dumped, then the price went down. Not sure about how the Nasdaq flaw happened, where people tried to sell before they lost their shirt, and then some of the uh, selling was not allowed to be sold when when they wanted their stock sold. Therein lies why there's lawsuits going on. Now, as far as the economy goes, it, it pretty well sucks. Um, you got a lot higher unemployment than what they want to you know, put it into a number. It's easy to see that. If you live in any city, well, it's easy to look around. You might see some more people going to work, but you still see a whole lot of people not working. And the, the Europeans, um, they're shaky over their euro. I mean, Greece, Italy, and and Spain are still in, in the crapper on their economy. From the reading that I've done, the, most Europeans are for keeping the euro, but it's not an even split. It seemed like it was like five in favor for every three that, that weren't. And you hear that now they're talking about, well, maybe we should make some type of a, uh, a big time banking council. And it sounds like that would be put together for uh, dishing out all the bailouts over there whenever the economy's crap out. Some type of big union of banks that would then Here's the dish the money and say, here's the money, but you got to do this, that, and the other. You got to do A, B, C, D, all the way through Z, or we don't give you the money. Now, last time I checked, that didn't work out too good with Greece. I don't think their people quite like having their pensions. Uh, robbed and cut and their wages cut all these cuts I don't think they like that in England either I don't think they liked it anywhere where the word austerity measures were word austerity and those measures were were done the politicians are what needs to cut back 
from spending the people's money, but that's not the game that they play. When you're holding a financial wrecking ball and you're told not to worry about it, you're not going to worry about it. The who are the pocket strings of this continual worldwide bailout. Isn't it strike anybody funny that whenever they talk about the world's richest people, why why do we always hear the the, the Bill Gates and the Buffett and the, this prince or this sheik or uh, I forgot his name but the the uh, rich guy in Mexico? I can't think of him right off the top of my head right now. But where is the Rothschild name? Or is are they so rich? I mean, they're not even. We know how rich they really are, but, but they're not talked about. Do you find that odd? You don't really hear them talk about the Blackstones. Some of these people that could buy and sell Bill Gates or Warren Buffett a thousand times over. You don't ever hear about them. You don't hear about George Soros anymore either. And your Occupy Wall Street, your Occupy this, your Occupy that. All you have to do is read about read George Soros's books, and he will admit in his books that's what he does. He uses his money. He pays to have uprisings occur where he wants them to occur. He, he actually pays to have that done. And then you get a supposed uprising and he tries to infect the normal people to get in with this supposed uprising so that it grows. And then you have you have an Egypt. Uh, you have a, a, a Syria. You have all these uprising things. He's part of it. And he admits it. He admits he enjoys doing it. And he does have uh, an end goal in everywhere that he does this stuff at. And he is a very large Barack Obama backer. So when Obama talks, you see a, a photo of Warren Buffett, you know, linked in with Obama, and he's, he's my financial advisor. Any, any stuff I need to know, I go to him. That's crap. But when you see him linked in with him, just forget about Buffett's face and think of George Soros because he is involved in these Occupy fundings. If you will look into it, you will find that, that, that he is going to end up being involved in it somehow, some way, somewhere. You'll be able to follow the money trail, and if they don't do a, a very clean job of covering up the money trail, you can always trace back to anyone, and that's what you have to do. You just follow the money trail, and it'll lead you to where you want to go and what you want to know. back over here <clears throat> like I was saying about Egypt Mubarak got life but that doesn't appear to be good enough for him they want him dead and they, apparently they may want his children dead uh, because they're really uh, protesting this hardcore so in that sense they're they are different than we are you know we get a, a verdict over here in our system and we have to abide by it we debate whether we like it whether we didn't like it fair not fair jury bought jury not bought things of that nature but these guys over here they don't want to accept things they want to have giant protests and uh, apparently he's going to appeal 
I think his appeal will fall null. But at the same time, while all this was going on and he was being overthrown, and knew, like I've said before, he just didn't play ball the way the the big boys wanted him to play ball now at this time. And so they removed him, just like the other leaders of the world that got removed. The Muslim Brotherhood, as I mentioned, would be a bad thing if it got control of this country, ruling control. And there's they're 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 trying to, just like we thought. And the military it's apparently running pretty much everything and the Muslim Brotherhood is kind of fighting for control with the military rule so things have not gotten any better for these people like I said before I do not see it you just had a, a get out of my way you're not gonna play ball that way then than I will, because they're gonna they're gonna let me play my way as as long as I get done what they want, you know, something kind of kind of like that. So now you got two groups wrestling for control to replace him. But it it's already been a stated fact: if the Muslim Brotherhood does get majority control, and they're a harder core, hard line group than Mubarak was then the people over there are going to get stricter rule. Not more freedom, stricter. And they will not be as cordial to the Israelis as what this guy was, because he was acting on our behalf to, to, to keep, pretty well, keep the peace. You can believe that or not, but do your homework, that's the truth. You know, that's why, that's why they were a close ally. And that's why it's rather odd, isn't it? I mean, if you go back uh, 2007, 2008, find the things that Obama said about Mubarak. Go back to whenever uh, you find anything about it and see how cozy they were. And then all of a sudden, boom, he's got to go, right? Do some thinking on that. <laughs> Well, I'm going to let everybody go right now. This got kind of long again, but I'm trying to cram all the things that I didn't get a chance to talk to you about while I was not on too much. Get us caught up. Don't forget, when you look up in the afternoon over here where I'm at, I believe it said it was like 3.34 or something in the afternoon when the transit of Venus crosses the sun. Uh, use a, something to shield your eyes so you don't get your eyes hurt and then when you look at it it's it's going to be something that you will never see again it's not going to be a giant ball you know like a eclipse or anything but it's going to look pretty cool because it, it, you're understanding that, that that is the planet and it is crossing at that that time and that way in a way that you're not going to see it again. And so that has to have some meaning for us. I hope and pray everyone is doing well in whatever situation that you're in. I hope that the Lord blesses each of you and helps you and fills you with His strength and His love. Pray for all the world. Don't forget all the world needs some prayers. Believers, non-believers, different faiths, everything. We're supposed to love our brothers that because maybe they don't do right, even though they may not believe anything. You still love them. You still pray for them because there's always time for them to come and turn themselves around. Their souls are worth saving, and so their souls are worth praying. Y'all be good. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.